this is not true. <clears throat> and how do we prove it? We can prove it by an example. Let's do a counter example for this phenomenon. So where we let's cook up an example where we do have a convergence in probability, but we don't have converged almost almost surely. This is what we are going to do. Um, for this example, uh, showing this um, that the uh, uh, converse direction is not true, let's actually do it again with indicators because indicators actually, in probability theory, quite often you can work with indicators and actually they tell you the essence of the phenomenon. In this case, let's take xn to be indicator of something. And now let's assume that a n, uh, a1, a2, etc. are independent and uh, such that um, uh, the probability of the nth event is uh, 1 over n. This is probably maybe related to one of the homeworks that we had earlier. So if you think of record breaking in independent stationary sports competitions, for example, or, or if you think of climate change, a stable climates and record temperature. So probability of making a record in nth year, you can, you can verify that it's one over n under some natural conditions. So here we have a um, sequence of random variables. They indicate, does a n occur or not? And we assume this property that the uh, independence and this. So then um, let's see. Let x be zero. And um, then if we look at, okay, what's the probability that xn differs from zero by more than epsilon? then we see that this is just the probability that um, xn itself is bigger than epsilon. And um, there are two cases. If epsilon is bigger than one, if F epsilon is at least one, so then this is zero always, well, because xn is uh, bounded by one. So you cannot uh, have bigger than one. If epsilon is between zero and one, if epsilon is strictly between zero and one, so then uh, what is this probability? Let's say the probability that xn is bigger than one half. It can only occur, xn is bigger than one half only if this uh, event an occurs. So actually, we learned that this is probability of a n in that case. And um, then we know that uh, the probability of a n is equal to one over n. So we can just write it there. So we write one over n here. This goes to zero when n goes to infinity. This goes to zero when n goes to infinity. So actually for regardless of what epsilon you choose, um, this goes to zero, that goes to zero. So we learned that um, in this case, xn converges in probability to random variable x, which is zero identically, okay? Here we have an example of um, convergence in probability to um, non-random variable zero. Well, it is a special random variable in the limit, which always takes the value zero. In this case, I'm claiming that we don't have almost sure convergence. Why not? Um, let's investigate the event omega zero again, the set of little omega such that x and omega converges to the limit zero. And now what is this, um, what is this event? So now we can write it, the set of omega such that the indicator an omega tends to zero. 
when does an indicator convert to zero? It is, it, this is true if and only if um, eventually you have a binary sequence, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. So when does the binary sequence have a limit zero? Think about the uh, visual picture. You have a binary sequence, one and zero, one, zero, one, zero. When is the in limit zero? The limit is zero if and only from some indexed onwards, you only see zero here. Yeah. So that means that um, the set of omega for which this gives you zero, so for which omega actually belongs to a n complement for all n from some n zero onwards. This is what it means to uh, binary sequence to uh, converge to zero in this case. Okay, this is a verbal. It's a verbal description. It's actually, it's rigorous. So there's nothing logically, uh, it's as rigorous as you would have used the logical um, quantifiers. And I would actually like you to, when you write homeworks and exams, so Remember that if you like, if you write something in, in plain English, but you are careful with your uh, English sentences and logic. So this is equally rigorous as using set theory or, or limit notation. Um, but of course, this text should be really careful how you write the, uh, some and for in which order. Okay. What is this uh, verbal description in set theoretic terms? Can you recognize? from some n0 onwards. So that means there exists some n0. And from that onward, something happens, uh, something actually not happens. Maybe if you recall carefully what we learned about eventually and infinitely often. So you might recognize that, aha, here, there exists. So let's put the union here. Let's put for all as an intersection and we translate this to we translate this to set theory. So for all n bigger than n zero. And then we put here the omegas for which omega is not in a n complement. So actually we can just write a n complement here. This is the set theoretic, really compact way to express this. If you write it this way, I hope this looks a bit familiar to you. So you might recognize that this is what we um, sometimes denote that uh, a n complement occurs eventually. That's that's the term that was used in the lecture notes, I believe. And then that's also the complement of a n happening infinitely often. And now we have independent events. The probabilities of the events were one over n. That one over n was chosen with the purpose. So we know that the sum of these probabilities, a n is equal to sum of the harmonic series, which we know that it diverges, so that's infinite. Then we know that this a1, the important thing was that we assume these to be independent. These two things are related to the borel cantelli lemma. That's the second borel cantelli lemma, which says that um, if these events are um, not rare enough, so then um, this infinitely often event, um, this infinitely often event is equal to one. So, we have rare events, but they are not rare enough. So they occur infinitely often. And that means actually, sorry, this should be complement here. So we have complement there and here we must have complement. Yeah. So omega zero, the set of omegas where we do have convergence, actually the complement of this infinitely often event. And we know that infinitely often uh, event has probability one from using borel cantelli lemma. So finally, our conclusion is that um, the probability of omega zero must be zero. So actually we conclude that 
probability that xn converges to the limit zero is equal to the complement of this, so it's zero. So especially xn does not converge to um, zero almost surely. Let's compare. We prove that xn converges to zero in probability, but uh, it does not converge to zero almost surely. Actually, the probability of this happening is zero. So on the contrary, you definitely don't converge to zero. This is the counter example and um, hopefully clarifying a bit what's the difference between almost sure and what uh, the convergence in probability. Time for a break, time for questions. Which one do you prefer, questions or break? Uh, one question. Yes, please. How the, how the probability of infinitely often uh, approaches one is linked to this almost eventually. So it's from second to last equation. All right. Last equation. It's um, by yes, it's by this equation here. So um, this one here. So the eventually uh, some something not happening eventually is actually the uh, by De Morgan's law. So um, yeah, let's make. Um, bit of space here and um, let's note that um, the probability uh, let's say um, the probability that um, how should I put it um, let's look at this way um, if I take union n0 bigger than one uh, one intersection n bigger than n0, a and complement. And if I take complement here, so I can use De Morgan's law to bring in the complement inside, but then this becomes intersection. So I use De Morgan. De Morgan's law gives me that I can take the complement inside. This first union becomes an intersection. And then I'm looking at the complement of this thing. And that's kind of inside uh, inside here. This is a kind of how the complement goes inside the union. Yeah. Then I will use De Morgan's law again. So I want to bring this complement inside the intersection and I can do it as well. So then there's nothing going on here. But then um, I can bring in this complement inside here, but then this intersection becomes union. So I get the union here. Then I have this and I bring the complement in there. That was the second application. Then I, I have a complement of a complement. So then they cancel each out. So I get just a n. And now by definition, okay, for every n0, there's some n still bigger than n0. That's what it means such that this occurs. So that's what we uh, define as a n um, infinitely often. So this symbol was defined to mean this um, set here. And uh, what we have here is the complement of um, something that was defined to be a n complement eventually. So this way, um, I'm not sure if this actually, was this answering your questions or were you asking something else here? It was helpful. Um, just okay. one, one more thing is, uh, is how, how we get from this infinity often uh, to the actual almost everywhere. Ah. Mm -hmm. Mm 
that's um, let's see infinitely often means okay so let me think um, if a and um, occurs infinitely often so it means that uh, then um, then the number of time indices if, if n is time so then um, kind of um, and, and now let's see if omega belongs to this infinitely often so <clears throat> then we would say actually on the event that um, a n occurs infinitely often on this event um, we know that um, this set of um, number of n such that um, let's see the number of n such that this occurs so such that omega belongs to a n is uh, infinite so it means that in this um, if you have this binary sequence so you see infinitely many times when you see one here occurring kind of uh, in this sequence and, and that means that you are looking such an omega for which uh, omega is kind of thinking think about that omega is one path of this full binary sequence of this in, infinite sequence so if you sample another omega you get a different path And maybe for some omega, you get the path where you don't see anything. So you have just empty sequence, only zeros here. And then you ask, OK, you have all kind of these binary parts, these infinite parts. So that's your set omega. You ask, OK, what's the probability? Um, um, and then you have these parts. Um, it's a, it, it is a subset here where a n occurs infinitely often so that's a sub subset of this full uh, omega and that consists of some parts binary parts and and so you ask okay what's the probability of this uh, binary this um, a n infinitely often so what's the probability measure what's the measure of this subset of the full space of parts and then what we learned in this um, borel cantelli lemma, so that told us that uh, borel cantelli lemma told us that this is uh, one. So the probability of the blue region is one. And, and these belong to the blue region because the, these were the parts where we were occurring signals uh, once infinitely often, and, and this one as well. So this was a path where we see this one infinitely many times. This was a red path because we didn't see any any signal and another red path is the one where we see one signal and then nothing anymore so the red parts is are in the red part of the space so the rest of the space uh, the red part and then what we if this blue part has probability measure one so then the red part of those sequence where we uh, don't see infinitely often uh, signals so that is zero and if something is zero, so then um, then we see that okay, this means that um, that means almost uh, surely, or almost for almost every almost every binary uh, infinite uh, binary path is um, such that you see these events occurring infinitely often. 